for joining us in this panel. Uh, I'm the moderator and we're going to share with you a newly formed partnership between Centro Hispano and the School of Education Psychology training programs. The purpose of this um, partnership is to provide linguistically and culturally responsive training in order to increase the mental health and well-being of Latinx communities. Uh, I'm Steve Quintana, I'll be the moderator, and I'm also the UW lead partner for the School of Education. Um, Evelyn Cruz is going to talk about, um, she's the lead partner for the Community uh, Center, which is uh, Centro Hispano, and she's the director of program planning and evaluation there. And she's going to talk to you about the social determinants of health and how we're addressing those within the Latinx communities. Alyssa ramirez Stegen is the director of bilingual services training that she's been recently hired, and she'll uh, provide an overview of the training that will happen over the next four or five years. And then Gabriela Gas uh, Hinojosa is the PhD student and is involved in the program evaluation. She's in the counseling psychology department and she's going to give the student perspective. And this partnership was funded through the Wisconsin Partnership Program and the Impact Grant Program. So the motivators for this uh, Wisconsin Partnership Program grant was part of his personal. I uh, used to work at the University of Texas at Austin. And a number of my uh, graduate students went off and started a bilingual um, training program to be able to provide services, uh, psychological services in Spanish as well as in English. And I thought that this was going to take off across the country. Um, and then it hasn't taken off. And so, um, you know, with the recent challenges that the Latinx community started, uh, um, I thought it would be time to sort of see what resources are available in order to do that. And then the other sort of motivators are clearly the injustices faced by the Latinx communities. Latinx communities are under siege. There's family separations going on. It's just heartbreaking. Children are placed in cages and in dehumanized ways. There's vigilantism going on in um, El Paso, Texas, that has a broader impact about people realizing it could happen anywhere. The public policy of the federal government is intentionally uh, cruel. The cruelty is really a design part of it. And then the broader community is uh, facing racial profiling that, that is happening. So even those that are documented uh, citizens of the U.S. are being profiled and have the potential to be detained and um, um, arrested of sorts. And then all of this leads to some direct and vicarious trauma, realizing that there are people like uh, the Latinx communities across the country experiencing these. We never know when there's going to be an ICE enforcement taking place in the Midwest or um, in Texas or anywhere. Um, on uh, and all those stressors are really on top of the chronic stressors of, involved in in, uh, in in the largely immigrant community that is uh, historically faced a lot of discrimination and racism, and then also ha has relatively low resources, little access to the political powers within the U.S. So those stressors are really on top of the more chronic stressors that have been faced in the Latinx community. Um, those um, stressors create a need for mental health services, but we face a work workforce shortage. There's only one bilingual psychologist who can provide the services in Spanish for every 4,500 Spanish-speaking residents in the U.S. And even when there is a bilingual provider, many times the language of treatment is determined by the preferences of the provider, of what the provider can, uh, which language they're most comfortable in, and some of the limitations of that. And then in a more just world, the language of treatment would be determined by what the client needed. Uh, for it. And so we really want to try to get to that place. Also, um, a lot of the oppression that Latinx clients receive and experience is in English, and it seems to just be salt in the wound to force them to receive healing uh, services through uh, English when English is the language of oppression of the oppressors. The mental health services are a special case because essentially the, the medium of healing is language-based. So there's a special role of language in mental health services and all the more reason why we need to be responsive to the client, what the client needs in terms of the language of expression and communication. And over um, probably 20 years, I've been um, working with Latinx graduate students. Many of them are wonderful and have bilingual skills and backgrounds coming in. And it seems like a, a, a lost opportunity to only train them in English. There's so much uh, need to be able to, nuances of language in terms of providing mental health services that we take English dominant folks and really help them learn the English of the treatment of, of counseling. So we really need to take the Spanish speaking students and be able to provide them with the Spanish of, of treatment of healing. 
And finally, um, there's a lot of assimilation pressures placed on Latinx university students. Um, UW and other predominantly white institutions prepare Latinx students to work predominantly in white and English-based contexts. And we really provide a little support for them to go back and give back to the community in terms of the Latinx communities and being able to provide those services and connections in Spanish. Here's the theory of change for the partnership grant. And so the School of Education Psychology programs are pooling together. We're going to recruit and train heritage Spanish speaking students. The, uh, what the research shows is heritage Spanish speakers are the ones that are probably best able to provide uh, the linguistically responsive services. And heritage Spanish speakers are those students who grew up in Spanish speaking homes and the families, but then usually went to US schools where English was the language of instruction. So the goal of the um, psychology programs is to provide linguistically, culturally, and situationally appropriate services in Madison and Dane County. And uh, the situationally appropriate services specific to Madison is based upon most of the bilingual training programs that are available are usually located in places where there's a relatively large Spanish speaking population, such as Miami, Texas, California. But in the Midwest, the Spanish speaking and Latinx populations tend to be fairly culturally and linguistically isolated. So that the, those situations require uh, special tailoring in terms of the services provided. And we want to be able to provide interdisciplinary approaches within psychology. So we have rehabilitation, school psychology, counseling psychology, and they each provide a different perspective into um, the services that we provide and be really rich to be able to have students from each of those sub-disciplines to be able to contribute to the discussions. And with a relatively small number of um, bilingual training programs across the country, we really need to build the research base and provide innovation in the services for the Latinx and bilingual communities. And so there's a lot of components of providing services to monolingual clients that doesn't have a parallel, that uh, isn't reflected in sort of working with bilingual um, clients. And so bilingual clients have cognitive complexities as well as uh, fluidity between languages that really need to be integrated that haven't even been considered within uh, most of the psychological services to date. And I'm going to allow Evelyn to talk more about what's going on in the Centro Hispano, the Latinx agencies, and how they're addressing some of the social determinants of health. A, a process goal for this partnership is to develop a model community university partnership to be able to cultivate an authentic, mutually beneficial community university partnership where there's mutual respect and mutual benefit. So there's a lot of challenges given that uh, the university and the, all the resources it has available to itself to bring into a community agency that's really operating on the front lines. The university can think about academic things, can really draw from a national uh, population and be removed, if you will, from some of the uh, realities that are going on in the community. And so we really needed to go intentionally into this partnership so that um, the voices are equally heard and that it's um, being able to mutually contribute to the outcome of it. And I know from the university perspective, it's, there's been a lot of rewards of this complementary partnership. The psychology training programs uh, have a good sense of what's going on mentally and sort of in the interior, the psychological processes going on within an individual, and then how that translates into behavior and into personal dynamics. And then the community agency is really well versed in terms of what's going on within the families and how is the family interacting with the communities and then also what are some community uh, broad um, whole community sort of interventions that can have some impact so it's been really rewarding to bring together the different sources of expertise and feel like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts the timeline for the activities is the year one which we're in uh, the partnership grant started in January 2020 and so our goal is to search and hire and uh, bilingual psychologists, and we've done that with Alyssa Ramirez-Stege. And then we're in the process of proposing a certificate training program to be able to be uh, to develop this integrated training to be able to provide for the um, service, be able to train students to provide linguistically and culturally uh, responsive services. We're interested in recruiting heritage language Spanish speakers uh, into the graduate programs. The graduate programs have a good history of recruiting um, bilingual students, and we were, want to build on that. And we have um, more opportunities for them to come in. So bringing in more of those folks and recruiting them to Madison and UW-Madison is our goal. 
And then we really want to integrate some of the what we learn within the Spanish-speaking bilingual training programs within the broader um, mental health programs that are part of the School of Education. And to be able to monitor the progress that we're experiencing, we need to translate some of the measures uh, in Spanish, both measures for the, uh, the training and what the graduate students are benefiting from, it, as well as the clients who are experiencing uh, these services and be able to monitor our progress in those domains. And then we're going to have um, do some evaluation activities, and um, Gabriela Gauss Hinojosa is involved in, in the, uh, the planning of those activities. And then just briefly, and Alyssa will talk a little bit more about the certificate programs, but uh, there'll be different courses. One will be a Latinx mental health class focused on what are some of the specific characteristics of mental health in the Latinx communities, how can we integrate cultural values, linguistic uh, styles within the services or the training for those services. Uh, there's going to be a Spanish language vocabulary class that would be available for many health service providers, not just psychology, but maybe psychiatric nursing, clinical psychology, Maybe social work um, students would want to have take that class as well. And then we're going to need to develop uh, communication and personal skills and training to be able to provide, again, that the language of therapy in Spanish. And then finally, Alyssa and others will be doing some supervision of field work that goes on in the counseling school psychology and the rehab uh, context within Dane County and Milwaukee. So that concludes my part of it, and I want to turn it over to my community partner, Evelyn Cruz, and she's the Director of Program Planning and Evaluation, and as I said, the lead community partner at Central Hispana. Thank you, Steve. Um, I will provide some information about the social determinants of health and about the community perspective in this grant. For, um, for my um, for my work in this grant, I will be speaking from my experience at the community level. I've been working at Centro for three years and 17 years at the systems level, mostly in public health, and um, doing program planning and um, evaluation. Uh, I also function as a volunteer co-facilitator for Centering Voices, which is a statewide strategy to address health equity. And um, I'm also a volunteer at the Board of Health representing Dane County. Next slide. So Centro Hispano was um, started in 1983 to support um, refugees coming from Cuba. Um, in recent years, it has grown to be um, the home for social programming for the larger Latinx community in Dane County. Next slide. Centro's mission and vision is to empower youth to strengthen family and engage community in such a way that Dane County will be a community where Latino families can aspire upward to reach their personal goals and dreams because they feel engaged and strengthened with the tools for success. Next slide. We aim to do our programming and services based on our values our values are the, to foster connection, to act with mutual respect and dignity, nourish community, live with courage, and demonstrate integrity. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of Centro, since we are not able to visit it. So um, Centro aims to provide a public health approach to our programming. Uh, we start from the individual level, and our programming is um, with wrapped around youth aspirations. We move outward to the community and adult programs, to the community, and then to systems level. Next slide. Some of the programming around um, our youth empowerment um, are to focus on shaping a better life for our young Latinos and to provide real alternatives and resources to provide them with a brighter future. Um, we have three main programs, a Juventud program in the middle school, Escalera program in the high school, and those are based on various connections, but mainly through a connection with um, the Madison Metropolitan School District. We have a homegrown program that is peer-led. It's also a high school program, and it's Regeneración. The main goals for the generation is cultural identity, social justice, volunteer engagement, and community organizing. Um, all of our programs are around cultural identity. Um, in terms of our programming, 
Um, Centro, as we, as, as Steve mentioned, um, we provide uh, work around the social determinants of health. So our programs support our everyday lives for our community, in our homes, our work, in the general environment in the community. Next slide. At home, we provide family support in addition to those individual programs for the youth. We also provide case management for adults in terms of um, referrals to services, identifying gaps for the community, um, providing language access, healthcare um, connections, employment, housing, immigration support, legal issues, et cetera, as well as an outreach plan to work with other um, Latino organizations, our community health workers, our promotoras that are roots for change, and then also through the La Movida. Next slide. So in terms of um, our adult programs, we have a jail diversion program called New Routes for Adults, and we provide cultural specific jail diversion program for um, supporting um, the adults that are involved with um, the, the justice system. We provide in taste, in, sorry, intensive case management, um, short term scope of um, to, to support um, uh, limited jail time and also to provide connections and support navigate in the criminal justice system. We also through this grant are aiming to provide AODA support services. Next slide. For our families, we also provide immigration services. About a third of our cases um, are, um, have an immigration related issue. Next slide. We also provide workforce programs. Uh, we have three um, pathways or Caminos programs, one that is connected to health careers, one that is connected to finance, and a new program that is in the process of being piloted, which is Caminos Progreso, which is our job readiness program. Next slide. Another one of our priorities in addition to supporting the families is also engaging with the community. Centro provides a home for Latinos in Dane counties to gather. We host over 100 community events a year. We have some signature events around our cultural connections, which are Tres Reyes, Dia de los Muertos, and others. We also provide um, space for um, uh, over 100 community programs. So, and thank you. And then we also provide a space for um, the community to gather, such as um, these classes, Zumba classes, the community gardens, as well as uh, Mercadito. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier, Centro's um, programming is around, um, has a public health framework. This is, um, the majority of our programs are around the social and economic factors that impact health. And those are conditions in which people are born, live, learn, work, and play, worship, and age that affect um, our health. Um, we also aim to work at the policy and program level. So the majority of the health impact for um, health outcomes is in the social and economic factors. Next slide. Some of the structural barriers that um, I have seen in my professional um, experience um, that impact health equity are the traditional public health approach versus addressing the social determinants of health. In the traditional um, public health approach, there's more um, emphasis put on impacting the environment and um, in impacting um, behaviors. In um, uh, more um, social determinants of health uh, approach, public health has a leadership in coordinating some of the social determinants of health that fall outside public health, such as housing, which we have seen in COVID-19 um, to be one of those um, areas where our population has suffered the most and has 
become a barrier to really being um, staying healthy um, during these um, difficult times. So some of the other um, structural barriers to addressing health equity include centering voices. And part of the reason for um, centering voices to um, be a difficulty in centering the voices of those most impacted by health inequities um, has to do with the value system. At the system level, we are more siloed in terms of our approach to addressing as well um, to addressing the um, health issues as well as the environment um, in health out in health um, behaviors is sort of what what we value the most. However, when we're trying to impact, um, when we're trying to center the voice of those most impacted, there's a different value set which is more um, holistic and collective in the approach. And so those are reconciling those differences in value sometimes is a difficulty in addressing um, equity. Um, voice is also an issue. Um, and what I mean here is that um, when we are part, we people of color are part of um, sitting at the table to address the issues, we tend to speak more holistically and um, sometimes our voice is, um, if we're able to sit at the table, sometimes we don't speak the voice of um, the table. So we don't speak English or when we do, um, our um, voice isn't always counted in the same way because sometimes just one of us representing the whole community or the whole um, um, many people of color. So voice tends to be um, a space where there is um, difficulty. Um, we also tend to speak more in storytelling to express the, the wholeness of the situation. And then many of the approaches in funding um, impact the voice at the structural level or the systems, which is more bullet point and more um, um, targeted in the approach. Um, another way that um, there are structural barriers to health equity has to do with the capacity for diversity and inclusion. Oftentimes, the systems or agencies that fund programming do, do not have the um, structural readiness to receive the community voice because their internal practices are not designed to support a different kind of voice with different values. Um, also, um, the issue of mutuality, which I think Steve mentioned earlier, which has to do with mutual respect and making sure that the issues at the table really represent a mutually beneficial approach to addressing health equity. Likewise, um, the leadership at the community level, there's a lack of investment in growing um, leadership at the different um, either um, health approaches or being able to have um, the leaders in the community have the skills that are necessary in order to navigate the systems and navigate the structural approaches to um, being part of policies and decision making at the um, systems level. Um, next slide. This, um, because of these things that I just mentioned earlier, um, and based on my experience at the state level, um, working as a funder for programs that aim to support community voice, as well as promising practices for addressing health inequities, um, I was, um, I try to put together along with, um, with my um, co-writer, um, Lori, we try to put together some information um, about what are guidelines for engaging uh, with researchers and evaluators um, in order to support community voice and strengthen our ability to work with, um, with systems. And in this, the idea for, for, this, um, for these guidelines for engaging with researchers and evaluators is really to support um, and provide guidance uh, as the community 
oftentimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, we also aim for these to be um, useful and in, um, in support community in these approaches, as well as to inspire and support ongoing development. Um, we also wanted for these issues to be, um, to be valuable. Uh, some of the themes are building and maintaining sustaining relationships, working together effectively, acknowledging and reducing power imbalances, engaging with research uh, processes and methods, and embracing cultural differences. Um, these have been, these guidelines have been shared by the UW Institute for Clinical Research, Clinical and Translational Research, and they have been adopted by the Prevention Research um, Center. Next slide. Um, this is the um, theory of change. Um, next slide. As I mentioned, um, we at Centro aim to work again from uh, with this public health framework. These are the programs at the upstream level, at the community level, supporting the social determinants of health. They're based on um, the values at Centro um, and based on bringing and supporting community voice. So at the individual level, youth evaluation and leadership development, which is currently being done through a partnership with Youth for Change. At the agency and community level, a transformative evaluation in a staff wellness plan. At the community level, uh, developing a pilot for AODA support group in collaborations with other community organizations serving the larger Latinx community. And then at the systems level, voice and collaboration in academic activities and bilingual and bicultural certificate um, that the Steve has um, talked about and that Alyssa will provide additional um, information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Thank you all. So I will be talking in my part of this, talking about my role as the Director of Bilingual Psychological Services Certificate, which is an emerging certificate. And hopefully, I am kind of interestingly positioned to do this. I'm a bicultural and bilingual um, counseling psychologist. I completed my PhD in counseling psychology here at the UW uh, Madison um, program. But I also did my bachelor's degree back home in Mexico, in Puebla. So also understanding what it means to be a bilingual psychologist, but also the lack of training and, and the need for culturally affirming training for our bilingual uh, clinicians and training, particularly here in Dane County and in Madison. So next slide, thank you. So since 2015, the Monitor on Psychology has had features about the increasing need that we have for um, Spanish speaking psychologists. So 2015, we had a feature. 2018, there's a growing Latinx community and we're needing um, competent psychologists who are able to provide services in Spanish. So really our hope with this programming is that in three more years, in 2021, maybe we can be featuring how we're responding to this increasing demand. So what does bilingual training look like right now? Only 5% of Latinx psychologists uh, or, or of psychologists in the U.S. identify as Latinx, compared to 18% of Latinx population in the whole of the U.S. And even though not all Latinx are bilingual, um, we see approximately about the same amount, 5% um, of bilingual Spanish-speaking um, or Spanish-speaking proficient um, psychologists as well. And doing a quick kind of review of what types of bilingual clinical training is out there right now, we found that about 15, there's about 15 programs, concentrations, or certificates that are in applied psychology at the master's level, and then about 10 at the doctoral level. And often the training varies widely in the number of credits, although usually they're between 9 and 12 because a lot of these are certificates. Um, and they all are, in some shape or form, incorporating both building knowledge of what it means to do culturally appropriate services for Latinx populations, and then actually building some of these skills and practicum experiences that are supervised. And then some of them add on to that 
advocacy, outreach, and then some cultural immersion um, experiences as well. So what we're hoping to do with this bilingual clinical training certificate is really we're putting together, it's a quite unique program because we're putting together counseling, rehabilitation, and school psychology programs. We're trying to recruit and train particularly heritage Spanish speaking um, students, as um, Steve was talking about, to provide this linguistically, culturally, and situationally appropriate services in Madison and Dane County. And to really be able to do that, we need to take an interdisciplinary approach to psychological services. And I'll talk in, in the next slide about what our model is going to look like. But we're also in this hoping to not only train students, but to also train them in how to implement research that makes sense for the community, that provides some innovation in how we do our practice and provide services, but overall that is improving the lived experiences of our Latinx community locally. So the training model is really going to be at the clinical level grounded in liberation psychology and anti-racist and decolonization frameworks. Um, we are part of a lot of psychologists who have over decades of work, kind of tried to um, acknowledge the cultural embeddedness of our Western approaches to psychotherapy as we know them today. In doing that, we're also hoping to develop in our students actual skills and how to do outreach and advocacy that brings them beyond that individual level approach of training with, um, with their patients to actually understand how can they inter intervene at community or even perhaps policy um, and practical levels. And we, we believe that we can do this by having these very um, intentional relationships with our community partners. And then ultimately, we don't want to just recruit students and have them do a lot of work for us, but also think about what is the experience of these students coming to a predominantly white institution and in a place where, you know, we're one of three different programs providing bilingual certificate training in the Midwest, and the other two are in Chicago. So we're also quite unique in our geographic location. And so what we also want to provide for students is engagement in culturally and linguistically affirming programming that promotes their personal and professional wellness and capacity to thrive. So when we talk about decolonization, um, really we need to understand what coloniality is about, right? And, and that is really at the core about having the supremacy of one culture over another and really the supremacy of European colonialist cultures that colonized our particular continent, right? And coloniality is about the systemic suppression of subordinated cultures by this dominant Eurocentric paradigm that is constantly pushing to modernize and then to modernize um, particular ways of knowing, particular knowledge, and particular practices. We also want to acknowledge the racial and historical trauma, really a focus on the traumatic effects of racism and colonization is not new. We are reinvigorated though by the recent calls and protests that have happened across the nation. Here you're seeing pictures that are all from our own colonialist um, backgrounds and histories and legacies here only in Madison, right? Um, so really understanding how do we push and develop training that considers our need to create decolonized spaces that address this racial and historical trauma, both individually and at collective levels, um, so that we can build more resilience and resistance of our local Latinx communities, including just the response to the huge shortage of Spanish-speaking and culturally appropriate services in our community. So really decolonial thought is really about trying to de decenter and dismantle this civilizing project of modern, modernizing constantly and recognizing that parallel alternative worlds are possible and exist together. And so a lot of our training is going to be also focused on how do we bring those ways of knowing into students, not only knowledge building, but also their clinical skills and practice. And that will mean, again, taking on this interdisciplinary approach where we are working across other fields that are not only psychology based. And we're trying to use these guiding questions focusing on our power structures. Why are the things the way they are? 
who is benefiting and what is being protected in this moment so that we can really make sure that at, at our core we're promoting um, strength and resilience. So the knowledge base, will, it has a foundation in Latinx psychology. We're really trying to um, build healing that understands distress and context, um, striving to develop interconnectedness, striving for individual and collective healing, and also infusing our own pre-Columbian, pre-colonization imagery, spirituality, and understandings of healing in this ways of knowing and practicing. So building this culturally specific sabiduría or knowledge and putting that into practice with different examples of interventions like cuento therapy where you, you're using storytelling or testimonios where you, you are listening to other people's um, stories or incorporating um, different folk tales and specific cultural knowledge like dichos. And then on my side as a supervisor for this, I also have to um, invite my students to challenge the system and also challenge it with them, right? I have to understand where they're coming so that we can both acknowledge and decenter and dismantle these practices as well. So um, a critical post-colonial resilience-based supervision framework um, we have been developing that really acknowledges the socio-political positionality of all the folks who are in the room when we're talking about clinical work, the patient, the clinician, the supervisor, challenging these Western conceptions of psychotherapy, developing relational safety that has a foundation in relational trust, focusing on the social context and power structures, going back to those guiding questions of who is benefiting, why are the structures the way that they are, and then recognizing that there's multiple ways of knowing and fostering resilience. And then ultimately, the other piece is about what our students are going to get out of this as well, right? Having culturally and linguistically affirming programming. So developing within our curriculum specific events that help build, build community and build students' self-efficacy and engagement and connection to their own cultural strengths and knowledge as well. So having things like um, a fall Latinx potluck, so a uh, spring writing retreat where we all go and do writing together that is also infused with other different um, self-efficacy uh, exercises as well. Having Latinx specific networking and professional development events like conferences with a meal, conferencias en cenas, or Latinx alumni connections. And then also building and scaffolding their abilities and skills to engage in advocacy and outreach work. So actually having a supervised practicum experience that might be related directly to how to build advocacy and outreach. And then finally, I want to all of us to recognize that we're all building this together. There are a lot of folks like us. We're taking a lot of models for folks who are similarly centering hope and esperanza, and that is how we have um, named our partnership is having this esperanza or hope that we can really promote radical healing in our communities, in particular our local communities of color. Ultimately, we want to have students understand how oppression operates and how to disrupt that both at individual and systemic levels so that we can promote change. And now I'm going to push it off to Gabriela Gauss Hinojosa, who's going to talk to us about her experience as a student within this partnership. Thank you, Dr. Quintana, Dr. Ramirez Tegui, and Evelyn. Um, so as has already been mentioned, my name is Gabriela Gaucino Josa, and I'm a second year doctoral student in the Department of Counseling Psychology. Um, I will be spending my time talking first about some of my professional and uh, personal motivations for being involved in this partnership, um, how, I'm, how I've been balancing my personal and academic responsibilities, the graduate training program I'm currently funded through, um, some of the program evaluation, some of the research I've been doing, and then concluding with some of the hopes I have for the role of graduate students in this partnership. So this partnership has been a really incredibly exciting opportunity for me personally and professionally. Regarding my personal motivations, I have been living in Madison for 10 years now when my family moved here from Quito, Ecuador. 
I went to high school and undergrad here, and I've met many loved ones in Madison who have struggled getting the support and services they need to address their mental health concerns. I know many bilingual Spanish-speaking friends who are struggling with chronic depression, suicidal ideation, due to some of the accumulative stressors that Dr. Q discussed earlier, living in poverty, uh, being undocumented, being questioned by their employers about their merits and intellect because of an accent. And my friends have said to me, um, I don't want to go to a therapist because they won't understand me. Or because last time I went to a therapist and told them about my problems, the therapist started crying. Or my therapist told me I wouldn't be so stressed if I was more independent and didn't let my family affect me so much, so I never went back. Additionally, when my family moved to Madison, we struggled finding mental health services that were responsive to the challenges we were facing as a family adjusting to living in the United States. These personal experiences are not only a big reason why I'm passionate about becoming a mental health provider, but also passionate about trying to do what I can do with what I know to ensure that this partnership is responsive to the struggles many Latinx and Spanish-speaking folks experience when trying to exist and live healthier lives in Wisconsin. That being said, we are only 10 months into what we hope will be a beautiful endeavor of many years. Um, so regarding my professional goals, ideally eventually years from now, <laughs> I hope to uh, be engaged in the training that Dr. Ramirez Stegi described um, and actually be able to provide direct mental health services to Spanish speaking folks in the community. Given the really early stages of the partnership, the role that graduate students can play at this moment has been a little ambiguous and has been very much an ongoing process and conversation. For me, this is partly meant processing my personal and academic responsibilities. I've been learning how to navigate um, personal value Latin views I have about what I consider research that, and clinical work that is community driven and community centered with the responsibilities and duties I have as a graduate student and researcher in training. This opportunity to explore um, has been directly facilitated by my job. My studies are currently being supported by the graduate training program in mental health equity. Um, a fellowship aiming to help me gain expertise and be prepared to intervene and disrupt inequities in health and wellness at individual group and system levels. Through this program, I have been conducting health equity research. I will be completing consultation projects and teaching courses related to equity and health services and policies. I would add, in addition to these skills, this fellowship has also given me time time and flexibility to truly explore how I make sense of ensuring my scholarship is congruent with my values. I've chosen to spend this time meeting and learning so much from the incredible, incredible Evelyn Cruz. Um, we've had many conversations about how power dynamics influence the relationship academia has with Latinx agencies and individuals. Evelyn has helped me understand how, for example, Regardless of having grown up in Madison, regardless of the love and passion I have for caring for this community, my community, um, because of the history academic institutions have had of exploiting communities of color for publications and prestige that doesn't directly serve or benefit them, I will very likely be met with skepticism and doubt when I enter community spaces as a researcher clinician. In the same breath, Evelyn has also helped empower me and how I can harness my knowledge and authentic self when navigating power dynamics I have experienced within the academy as a young woman of color and early professional. We've had conversations about how trust building is a crucial part of the research process um, that is community engaged. Conversations about how research can be more culturally responsive and equitable. Conversations about how researchers can leverage the talent, expertise, and skills of community members without overburdening them. Then COVID happened. Then the blatant display of racism and police brutality happened. These conversations of community-based research are happening during a time in history when the shortcomings of our healthcare system, the shortcomings of our social services, the shortcomings of our policies are highlighting the disposability of the life and dignity of Black, Indigenous, people of color. Next slide. 
So as a result of these charlas and conversations, um, in addition to drafting um, a memorandum of understanding for the partnership um, in combination with some of my personal values and within a context of academia where there is a big incentive to publish, um, I have chosen to spend the time I have been awarded through my fellowship engaging in mental health equity research being responsive to Centro's needs by applying my skills through program evaluation and also intentionally decentering my academic endeavors to care for my loved ones. I'm trying to apply my counseling psychology expertise outside of the academy um, by working with the Wisconsin Center for Education Research, Centro Hispano, and the cooperative Raices para el Cambio, Roots for Change in program evaluation for a leadership development training aiming to promote health and wellness by fostering spaces that are co-created um, if self-reflection of community-driven activism and civic engagement. This has been an incredible opportunity for me to work closely with the first and only Latina Indigenous immigrant-led health co-op in Dane County and learn from their leadership development training while also directly applying my research skills to support Centro Hispano's practical needs and transformative evaluation programming that Evelyn talked about earlier. I'm also currently working on a research study on how heritage Spanish speaking social service providers and mental health providers are using their knowledge professionally to address the gaps of their previous training that may have been only in English. Some of our preliminary results have shown how multilingual, multicultural Latinx professionals have used their knowledge about acculturation and mental health stigma to decide when and how to switch from Spanish to English with their clients, or know when regional accents in Spanish may interfere too much with therapy and therefore choose to refer clients to someone whose Spanish may be more congruent with the client's linguistic background. Some of these initial findings of how and why multilingual mental health providers may be language switching and code switching with clients aligns with what many scholars have coined translanguaging, a framework positing that for multilingual speakers, languages are not discrete and separated English, Spanish, but form an integrated system. Multilingual competence emerges out of local practices where multiple languages are negotiated for communication and competence does not consist of separate competencies for each language, but a multi-competence. And language proficiency is about hybrid repertoire building rather than a total mastery of each and every language. We hope that extending a traditional deficit focus interpretation of language mixing and incorporating a strength-based perspective as to why people language switch or mix languages could help make both training and therapy an affirming and healing space for multilingual individuals, like, I, like Dr. Ramirez that you were speaking about earlier. Next slide. Thank you. However, as excited I, as I am about this current research project, and despite taking a strength-based approach and expanding to expanding our understanding of the competencies of Spanish-speaking mental health providers, our current methodologies and research processes do not perfectly align with what I have learned this past year and what Evelyn described earlier to be community engaged research. So as Evelyn has described, community engaged research works with members of the community to serve their needs. It works to build the capacity of individuals and the community in ways to reduce the influence of dominant cultures it co-constructs rather than imparts knowledge in the research process. And it acknowledges that at all times, community must benefit, the community must benefit from the work. We have informed the leadership, oh, can you go back please? Thank you. We have informed the leadership at Centro of the study design. We have consulted with leadership at Centro about some of the components of the study we're currently doing. Um, but we have yet to engage in research that is collaborative and empowering for community members. My hope is that down the road, as we build on trust, respect, and integrity, we also create the infrastructure for graduate students like myself to be involved with re in research that involves, collaborates with, and empowers non-academic Spanish-speaking members of the community. Next slide. 
So we are at a point in this partnership where the ambiguity of the role of graduate students also allows for imagination and hope of what could be. As technically the first graduate student engaging in this partnership, um, I have a few ideas as to how we can engage future graduate students in partnership activities that are mutually beneficial for both the community partner and graduate students' personal and professional growth. My hope is that a community-based bilingual training program provides graduate students of this program with the following transformative experiences. Training and supervision on culturally linguistic and contextually responsive and responsible therapy. Training and supervision outside the scope of traditional individual office-based therapy on counseling interventions targeting systems and institutions aiming to prevent and develop as opposed to just restore psychological wellness, such as addressing social determinants of health, like Evelyn mentioned, and using innovative methodologies such as consultation, program evaluation, media campaigns. Along the same vein, training and supervision, emphasizing the development of competency in the areas of interdisciplinary systems and advocacy in order to facilitate our ability to collaborate and build on the strengths and resources available in community settings of linguistic and cultural isolation and hostility. To engage with different value systems and different voices about health equity, like Evelyn had described earlier. Finally, funding via program assistantships, research assistantships that encourage and incentivize the application of our unique training model under faculty supervision because the experiences I have had trying to apply my research outside or my research knowledge outside of academia were directly facilitated by the time and flexibility granted through my fellowship. So in order for graduate students to engage in community-based research with integrity, our learning, training, and transformation needs to be scaffolded, like Dr. Ramita Stegi mentioned earlier. My hope is that incoming graduate students not only have the time I have chosen to spend cultivating trust and critically reflecting on how my expertise can directly serve the community, but that these conversations and reflections are incentivized, encouraged, and prioritized as central to our development as scholars and as researcher practitioners. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free to follow up with us and I believe that we will be responding to um, questions in the chat, and you're welcome to follow up with us afterwards. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for all the panelists, and, and really looking forward to five years of really working together and growing together. Thank you. Switch to live now. So I have the panelists here, and so I really appreciate those that uh, in the audience that uh, are participating in this. Would love to get some of your questions, and, and again, the panelists are available to answer questions that you might have. I know there's one question about how do we know uh, how the mental health needs of the Latinx community have been affected by COVID? And I can partly answer that and maybe others can chime in too. Um, you know, the Latinx community is out and oftentimes they're on the front lines, their, their uh, essential services are being provided so that they're at greater risk for exposure to COVID and are experiencing infection rates about two or three times the rate of the white population. Uh, and so that there's a lot of the help needs just to sort of maintain health uh, and access to health care and just additional stress that goes on. Um, and then the mental health services are really being provided by um, telehealth. And so it's getting used to that mode of delivery. This is Evelyn. I can share a little bit of information too. Um, the COVID crisis has exacerbated systemic gaps um, across all systems. And regarding mental health, um, there is, um, again, more need. Uh, uh, there was already a gap in the number of providers that could provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services, as we have been noting through, um, through this presentation, so that the need is even greater. Uh, there's a lot of emotional support that is needed because in addition to the disease um, and the conditions, uh, the fact that parents are teaching in homeschooling 
um, and many other um, issues that have been, as I mentioned, exacerbated by the crisis that have put added stress on the families and individuals in our community on top of the existing um, services uh, to address the needs. So that is just a compounded uh, process right now, a compounded need. I think it also shows the resilience in our community um, and it also um, speaks to uh, how our families are coming together to support each other. Uh, nonetheless, we do need to note that there is a huge need um, that it is currently unmet. And I can speak to the piece um, about how maybe students who are part of this training might be engaged in this. So the reality too is that we are just an emerging certificate right now. So we don't have students who are actively doing the work as, under this Esperanza certificate umbrella yet. I think a key piece that um, Evelyn is pointing to is that the inequities that we already were seeing in Dane County for our Latinx communities are only going to deepen more because of COVID. There's a lot of resiliency within our communities, but part of developing this partnership and part of developing this type of training is in response to inequities we were already seeing pre-COVID. And so we need to take a long-term look and how do we actually respond in ways that make sustainable and sustained change over time? So that our, yes, we have a grant to develop this, but then in 10 years, what is this gonna look like for our communities? How do we bring this back to actual implemented change? And on the student side of this, we want to build the strength and resilience of our students who are already going into communities, right? We already have uh, clinicians in our community who come from our counseling psychology program, for example, from other um, school of education programs. And so again, how do we build our own community resilience and put it back out in a way that it's an iterative process, is a circular process, and ultimately is again, with a long-term vision, not only in responding to crisis situations and crisis moments, but actually implementing change in the long-term. We have another question that is, do we follow the students after they graduate? And I can partly address that in the sense that um, many of the uh, practitioners in town are graduates of our program, and especially those that are serving the Latinx community. Have, uh, we've been able to keep some of those folks around. And so the, having UW-Madison here in Madison has allowed us to grow that uh, capacity. And what we'd like to do is be able to staff the, the workplace uh, for us for Wisconsin and broader throughout the programs. Um, and then I didn't know if anyone else wanted to address that, the, the role of uh, graduates. We do follow them closely and uh, learn from them and we rehire them sometimes. And so Alyssa comes back and so, uh, and I'd also like to say that we have a wonderful uh, group of undergraduate students that come to UW-Madison. They're very skilled and uh, we've been teaching a class for them for a while and just really impressed by the uh, quality of the students. What kind of graduate study works well with this certificate is the question. Yes, yeah, so overall we're functioning under the umbrella of psychology right now. And so a lot of the ways that we're, we're partnering at the university level will be through school psychology, rehabilitation psychology and counseling psychology. These all have master's level and doctoral level um, trainings, right? Um, maybe perhaps in the future, we might be able to expand some of the certificate training to other folks who are also in the helping professions like social work, um, physician's assistants, other folks who are also wanting to get um, clinical skills in Spanish um, so that they're able to effectively work with folks as well. Yeah, we had just a comment that social work is reaching out to us, so we hope to be able to build it with social work, but we also have psychiatric nursing. Clinical psychology uh, is another domain, and then other uh, mental health fields and working with communities. And we hope to have seed other kinds of certificate training, such as, as the undergraduate level. How can we prepare our Latinx students to be able to provide uh, community services in Spanish relative to community agencies as well? 
the, right now there are no more questions, but we have a few more minutes. So the question is, is what challenges and opportunities do you see emerging from the switch to mobile mental health services for your work? That's a really interesting question. I think a lot of psychologists were moving into tel doing telehealth or um, kind of video and phone services. Um, in a lot of ways, insurance companies often are driving the ways in which we're doing the type of work that we're doing because they reimburse our services. And I think there was some reticency from kind of higher up structure systems um, in allowing some of this to happen, right? In places like the Midwest, like Wisconsin or Iowa, there's also been a push to increase telehealth because we also have very rural communities. It's a lot easier for us to reach out to folks who are accessible via phone or telehealth. What we find from some research, mostly research that is not necessarily being done with Latinx communities, but mostly with white communities, is that telehealth and telepsychology is actually pr probably as effective as in-person psychotherapy, right? Um, so a thing for us to, as kind of scientist practitioners always to keep in mind as well, is how do we increase this access and also make sure that as we're increasing access, the quality maintains and remains the same. Um, I think a main uh, maybe opportunity more than challenge, we'll be able to be doing some of these services in more rural areas, particularly with folks who have less access because of where they are or because they don't have the mobility to get to where our services are, right? It'll be interesting, I think, for us to see whether or not the, these kind of leniency in our guidelines and how we practice remains even after COVID, if we find that some of these practices are particularly helpful for reaching these harder to reach communities. I think one of the things, I, I, I love um, everything you shared, Alyssa, because I think it's really important um, to see all the opportunities that the virtual um, world can provide. Um, sometimes uh, when there are inequities, they could also be deepened by these kinds of situations so that there are um, places in, in part of our communities too that are because of the difficulty with housing um, and how COVID has impacted the housing for many communities, then may, there may be less um, confidential spaces and there may be opportunities for um, addressing some of those um, gaps that could be deepened by um, inequities that were already existing and that COVID has uh, made worse. Thank you, Alyssa and Evelyn. The next question we have is, could you talk more about the collaboration with school rehab and counseling psychology and how that will look? Um, and I can partly address that is what we envision is having with rehabilitation, for example, focusing on disability issues, but also probably with related to the jail abatement, as well as addictions, is that they'll bring those expertises in, into the sort of field work that is done. And the school psychology works with uh, families and in, in the in students in educational systems. And then counseling psychology works uh, with the adults and mental health. So we really have a lifespan approach to the services. And so it'd be wonderful to have those students and faculty be part of this program so that we can be uh, one-stop shopping, if you will, for many of the, 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 the clients coming in. Another question is, um, are there any undergraduate courses that you recommend for students looking to apply for the bilingual certificate? Um, I can the, talk about I think, that. Yeah, um, go ahead. So I actually, I did my undergrad at UW and I took um, a Latino mental health class taught by Dr. Steven Quintana and Alisa ramirez Tegui when I was a sophomore. And that's how I got introduced to them, introduced to research opportunities. Um, and that might be a really good way to um, get to know who is involved in the certificate and learn more about um, more research and skills that could be applicable for graduate programs. Yes, yeah, so it will be a cross-listed counseling psychology and Chicano and Latino studies class that um, we will be teaching this spring, so if you're interested, um, definitely enroll for it. It's 530 CPCLS 530. <laughs> Plug for that. And also, I would say, so as a counseling psychology department, we're, and, and 
um, with rehabilitation psychology as well, we're moving towards um, our kind of major in health promotion and health equity. And so another class that I've been teaching this semester is um, the Counseling Psychology uh, 237 class. And so that's um, working with diverse communities. So it's about self-awareness, mental health, and social justice, and how do we work with diverse communities and a lot of the frameworks and how we're thinking about um, and being in conversation with Evelyn too about like what do we mean by trying to not only address mental health but the social determinants of health and what what these frameworks could look like in the future in an actual partnership with our community members. Thank you Alyssa and Gabriella and Evelyn. Um, any other questions come up? We're very grateful for your involvement and excitement and enthusiasm for the program. Um, you know, we're bracing for what's going to happen with the community. The Latinx community has been under siege for a while, and if uh, things change and if they're less so, will they then be needing to do some healing? So now they're sort of in a survival mode, just trying to get by day by day. And then once some of that intense pressure may let up, then there may be some space for healing to go on and to be able to work on other things other than just getting by day by day. Does anyone want to speak to sort of what they see as the next stages for the uh, next stages for the Latinx community? Or do you have any more questions to the audience? One thing we hope to do is be able to better understand language in the use of uh, therapy, but then also how it happens within the community. And so uh, Gabriella talked about the translingualism. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear how other folks um, are maybe, how that's sitting with folks, especially folks in the audience who may be multilingual or speak multiple languages. Um, because we're really, what we're trying to assert is um, building on this notion that there's no such thing as like one perfectly fluent English speaker and one perfectly fluent Spanish speaker in one body, but rather um, there's a much more complex process happening amongst people's relationship with their language and their language background, um, how often they use it, um, how uh, strong their affiliation to one language is with another, depending on the context that they use it in, um, what the broader social context or contextual factors could be um, influencing whether or not you would want to speak the language or not. So I'd be curious to hear if anyone has any comments or thoughts about that. And I think Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes left. I was going to say, I think one of the key pieces to, to add on to what Gabriela is saying about how we're thinking about language and the practice of counseling-related skills um, is that often we're asking practitioners who are multilingual to receive um, their training in English and often also from kind of Western-based psychotherapeutic approaches, and then go and practice in culturally diverse and linguistically diverse um, populations and with different languages that, than what they have been trained to practice in, right? And so part of this training is also how do we provide that space where that all of the pieces and how we might use language is also um, infused in, in our understanding of what our practice is as psychologists as well. And so well, we have a question uh, about what to do with students who might feel shy about their level of Spanish when it comes to helping the Latinx community. Yeah, I would, um, 
I resonate with that. <laughs> I grew up in a multilingual household um, with varying degrees of opportunities to use my Spanish in professional and academic settings. Um, my comment to students who may also feel like shy about whether or not if they predominantly use English in academic or professional settings, um, I would just remind students um, competency when it comes to language, competency in terms of helping the Latino community is beyond just knowing how to translate different words. Um, as someone who is Latino, who grew up in a Spanish speaking household, even though you may not know how to use like big elaborate clinical terms yet, um, you have knowledge about what are some of the structural or contextual factors that are influencing healthcare access. You have knowledge about how is, how is culture influencing healthcare access. And that knowledge is super, super valuable and it's an asset um, that you can build upon by uh, building on maybe some more linguistic um, competencies that you can get further in your training. But I would encourage you to um, seek out opportunities and just remind yourself of the strengths and assets that you have already. Yeah, once we bring in uh, language differences into therapy, it really introduces a lot of things such as uh, differences in accents as well as different social status that might be communicated by various accents and needing to sort of be aware of our own experience with language. We do have another question up about the generational trauma uh, that's, that occurs uh, across generations uh, that are influencing the Latinx community and then also some of the fears about some of the trauma happening now that would uh, be passed on through generation by generation. Will one of the panelists address uh, sort of intergenerational trauma? I think that was some of the examples that Gabriela was offering in her own narrative and her own experience in Madison as well, and how that actually plays out in people's not only individual and familial experiences, but at a community level as well. I think that um, that is part of what um, I think that there's just many layers to generational um, trauma and to, you know, to trauma that it's important to think about what are the opportunities for impacting and what are the assets that can be built on. Um, for um, us at Centro, one of the main ways that we um, aim to impact that is through um, programming that intersects uh, various levels of impact um, from um, youth, uh, to families, to the rest of the community, as well as anchoring a lot of the work around um, uh, cultural or cultural roots um, and re trying to reduce isolation within the community, as well as trying to find programming that provide education and empowerment opportunities for, for the community. So that there are um, many pathways to impacting um, trauma and to, in, you know, to trying to address what is happening. And I, I would just add, when we're saying, like, for example, someone feels shy about their use of Spanish language, we need to recognize that as embedded also in our intergenerational and colonial trauma, right? Our language loss and or the uh, kind of uh, putting on of a language of us is part of that colonial history. And um, so I think part of my encouragement is for us to name that as part of these systemic ways in which oppression has happened, and then to also kind of try to go against some of these um, tendencies and, and ideals of wanting to do something in a perfect way or in a great way, and actually recognizing that that, that may just be the way, right? That, that, that whatever relationship that we are having is because of our histories and past, and that's okay, and how do we move from that into a healing space as well. I think we'll have to wrap up though uh, now, but thanks so much to the panelists and all your work uh, for work today, but then also all the experiences and expertise that you bring to this. And 
uh, clearly the conversation is just getting started. We look forward to working five years and we're going to update the diversity forum as we move along through this certificate program and, and, and partnership with Central Hispano. So thank you very much for your attendance.